Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to St. Saviour's. We're so glad you're joining with us for worship this morning. We've just got a few announcements. Uh, one is that this evening at half past seven, we have our usual Zoom prayer time. So please just uh, look at your parish email for the link uh, or do get in contact with me and I'll send you the link. But do join us for a lovely time where we'll take what Richard preaches on this morning, the passage, and we'll pray our way through it. So do join us this evening, half past seven on Zoom. Then as we move through the week, we have on Wednesday night, our midweek, it was great to have uh, Harry, our BB captain, and Bishop Harold last week. And this week, we're going to be joined by the Reverend Andrew Sweeney, who I know from a few years back, and he will be well worth listening to as we interview him and he shares from the word of God. Uh, then if we look to next weekend, there's quite a lot happening. Uh, but one thing I'd love to direct you towards, if you want a day of retreat with John and Anne Coles, a day of reflecting on the Holy Spirit on the eve of Pentecost Sunday, the diocese are putting on a really special retreat day. So if you check our Facebook uh, and uh, the Down and Drew Moore Facebook as well, you will see links to a really special retreat day. As we seek as a church to go deep and wide, this will be a great opportunity for depth. Then next Sunday, we have our usual services. We have uh, 10 o'clock here in Dollingstown. We have our half 10 online service and our half 11 Marilyn service. But as well as that, uh, we're just trialing an extra service uh, with a view that maybe we'll try something similar in September. So next Sunday, as a one-off, we're going to try a four o'clock service and that will be here in St Saviour's and it will be a compressed version of the morning so it'll be from four till about 4 40 it'll be compressed it'll be a good length of time for for children and for young people to join us for young families to maybe give church a go after being away for a little while and we really encourage you to try and then I'll ask for some feedback to see how we've got along, but four o'clock and you'll be home in time for tea. So book as you would normally for our other services and do join us. If you're not there in the mornings, come at 4 p.m. and uh, worship with us uh, at our four o'clock service. I think those are all our announcements. I'm now going to pray as we move towards uh, the beginning of our service. For those who uh, were on our midweek uh, and heard Bishop Harold Miller, he focused, he focused quite deeply on Ascension Day. And we'll hear that reflected a little in this prayer. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Mercifully give us faith, to know that as he promised, he abides with us on earth to the end of time. Him who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's worship.
faith the prophets all a day. When the longed for Messiah would appear, with the power to break the chains of sin and death, and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go. The power of the Spirit to the lost To deliver captives and to preach good news In every corner of the earth We will stand as children of the promise We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul Now before Nicola comes to lead our intercessions, let's confess before God our sins. Heavenly Father, we come before you as sinful people in need of your grace. We sin every day in what we say, what we think, what we do, and by what we should but don't do. Show us your loving mercy in the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Let us still our hearts this morning before the Lord. Father God, creator and sustainer of heaven and earth, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for all the good gifts that you've given us and we praise you for the best gift you've given. Your only son, Jesus Christ, whom through his life, death and resurrection, we as sinful people have graciously been reconciled back to you. Lord, as we marvel at the mystery of the cross, we thank you and praise you for your grace in saving and redeeming us. Lord, we pray this morning for those who are suffering, whether it be from financial difficulty, ill health, loneliness, or going through a difficult season. We bring these people up to you. We bring our worries and anxieties to you because you care for us. Psalm 147 reminds us 
that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. We pray you, O oh God, would comfort those in need this morning and remind them of who they are in you, a beloved son and daughter bought at such a price. Father, we pray for the church globally. Lord, would you protect those serving you in war-torn countries or in places where it is illegal to be a Christian? We pray your Holy Spirit will continue to dwell where your people are. And Lord, use us to help our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, whether through giving or through prayer, so that your work will be done. Lord, we pray for those countries where COVID-19 remains high, such as India and Africa, and we ask for your healing hand upon these countries and for the virus to relent. Be with the medical professionals and equip them with the resources needed to fight this disease. And Father, we pray for Israel and those in the Middle East. We ask that the violence would cease and peace will be restored. We ask for your comfort to those affected and your peace that surpasses all understanding will be felt during this difficult time. Lord, we pray for our church here in Dolanstown and Marlin and for those watching online. Lord, continue to build up your people. We pray for Simon and Carlton and the many other leaders in our church. Equip them to lead your people daily and protect them from temptations from the evil one. We thank you for the youth ministry taking place this morning, Lord. Father, would you soften the hearts of the young people and allow them to grow up knowing you as their father. We thank you for the youth leaders serving this morning and we ask for energy needed to carry out this important task. And Lord, we thank you that we get to live in community with one another and we ask that we would encourage one another in the faith. Let us join together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory and praise to the King, crowned with 
today can be found in the book of Colossians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 5 it reads for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Well, let's just go to prayer before we open God's word. Well, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time together, and we thank you for your word that has just been read. Lord, I pray that through the power of your spirit, I would be able to interpret this truth, and for the people listening, Lord, that they would be encouraged and built up in the faith. Holy Spirit, come upon us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, Simon, I just want to give you uh, the opportunity to thank you uh, for letting me speak today. And people often ask me, what it is like to have Simon Genoa as a boss. Now, normally these people are quite jealous and envious that I have him as a boss. Uh, and to be honest, I don't think he's too bad to work for either. But just in case you disagree with me, I've been asked to speak twice on Sunday since I've moved here to work. One was on a Sunday after my holidays and another is today, uh, which also happens to be my birthday. So that maybe gives you a different side to Simon that you're not familiar with. But on a serious note, we're very fortunate to have men like Simon and Carlton leading this congregation, or as I prefer to say, contending for the life of this congregation. One of the jobs of a minister is to contend for the faith, for the life of the congregation in which God has entrusted to them. It's not a task to take on lightly, but one in which you and I should strive to support them in. And when we look at Colossians 2, and especially these verses 1 to 5 that we read today, we see the Apostle Paul contending for those at Colossae and Laodicea, which is about nine miles away from Colossae. And we've touched in previous weeks that Paul is in prison while writing this letter. And reports must have got back to him about some things that were going on in the church. If we look at verse 8 later on in chapter 2, we see that Paul has received reports that people have come into the church and have made up human traditions that have had the potential of leading people astray. And when I was thinking of leading people astray or other things astray, my mind wanders back to the farm. Uh, and each October, uh, it's one of the envious jobs we have to do on the farm is to go out to the fields and bring the cattle back in for the winter. Now picture the scene, the cows have enjoyed the fields, the wide open space, nature all summer long. And then one day, two men in a pickup and a cattle trailer turn up. I wonder what's going through their minds when they see these vehicles turn up. Well, we have a plan. Dad reaches into the back of the pickup and out comes a bucket of meal. Well, we walk down the field and anyone who is a farmer watching knows the difficulty it is in getting cattle out of a field into a cattle trailer. Well, dad takes the bucket and checks and he walks up the field. And of course, the majority of the heifers follow. They know there's a treat in the bucket. 
Well, as dad walks up, he gets into the pen. I come behind the cows and shut the pen door. Little do the heifers know that they've been trapped, that they've been deceived. We're bringing them back to the farm. It's not really a treat. And folks, I think this is a little bit like what Paul is warning us today. Some things seem really good in the surface, but they can deceive us and they can condemn us. And to counter this, Paul is teaching the church. Last week, we looked at the end of chapter one and verse 28 says that Paul is proclaiming, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that they may present fully mature in Christ. Paul wants to teach the church about Christ. And this contending that this verse talks about is almost like an Olympian struggle. It's an active, ongoing thing. He has a burden for the church, a church that he has never personally met, but a church that he is praying to and writing to. I wonder if you have a burden for the local church, a desire to see this church rooted in Christ alone, rooted in the word of God. If you do, you will encounter problems along the way, people pushing you back, perhaps spiritual attacks. But in this context that Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, what is he so eager to contend for? And friends, it's a problem each church and in each generation will have to contend for. What are we to make of Christ? If I were a non-Christian and bumped into the Apostle Paul, or Simon, or Carlton, or one of you, for that matter, I wonder what question I would ask. And I think I would ask this question. What does Christianity offer me? I wonder how you would answer that. I reckon there's a host of answers floating about your head. Christianity offers you health, a new life, health, wealth, happiness, success, promise of a better job, the fulfillment of all my desires. These are among many of the things that I've heard people say when they answer that question, what does Christianity offer me? To which there should be a very simple and biblical answer. What does Christianity offer us? Christ. And that is what Paul is focusing on right throughout the letter of Colossians. It is in him alone. If we go back to verse four of chapter one, Paul reads, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. He has a reason for thanksgiving. And if we look at chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, which just come after these verses we're looking at today, Paul says this, So then, just as you, just as you has, have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives rooted in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. When offering the gospel to someone, we offer them Christ. Yes, forgiveness, joy and peace all overflow from that but they're the benefits of having Christ and knowing Christ. This is what Paul is contending for, the very heart that completes the church, Jesus Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his pouring forth of the Holy Spirit. These are crucial to the life of the church. This is what the scriptures are about. That's why I've titled today's talk, Christ plus nothing equals everything because you, have, you can have everything. And if you don't have Christ, you have nothing. Now, if you're skeptical of that equation, we'll put it to a stress test at the end of today's talk. But that's what Paul is contending for here. That is what we're going to look at this morning. His very struggle that you and I and the church at Colossae would know Christ, rest in Christ and be content in Christ because it is only in him that we have real everlasting hope. And some of you may know a gentleman in church called Ronnie Irwin. And Ronnie led a Bible class on Sunday mornings for a group of teenagers for about the age of 10 to 13. And Ronnie would do what every uh, assistant, Sunday school assistant would do. He would tell a story, he would get us to pray, he would open the Bible, but he also knew we were teenagers and we would forget a lot of what he had to say and we would get distracted. And I have to confess, I got distracted many times. But now and again, Ronnie, just to reinforce a point, would get his finger and he would wag around the group. And he says, if you never remember anything that I ever taught you, I want you to remember this. We're saved by grace 
through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Ronnie wanted us to remember the core foundation of our hope and assurance was Jesus Christ. And because of Christ, we have forgiveness, freedom, meaning, hope, eternity, satisfaction. Only in Christ. And if it's not in Christ, it won't last. And everyone sitting at home, whether at the kitchen table, in your bed, in the living room, you are searching for all those things. And what Paul and what I want to tell you today is that it is only in Christ that you can attain them. As verse 3 tells us, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, not in human tradition, but in God. And people in Colossae had come into the church and it tried to urge the church that knowing Christ wasn't enough. They needed a deeper experience of these truths and realities. Some of them were dabbling in Jewish philosophy and pagan practices. And as a church, we need to be weary of venturing outside of the core claims of our faith. It was almost as if people were coming into the church saying, Christ will meet some of your needs, but he won't meet them all. And as we look at verse 2 in today's passage, we see that Paul has some goals, some desires for the church. He wants them to be encouraged in heart, united in love, and to know Christ. He wants an encouraged church. Folks, what would church be like if we encouraged one another rather than put one another down? What would church be like if we showed forgiveness? What would church be like if we pointed people to Christ? There's people in the church struggling in their faith, struggling with personal issues. Do you care? Do I care about them? Paul wants us to encourage one another. Secondly, he wants a church united in love. United in love with one another. And on those two things, encouragement and unity, hinge Jesus Christ. Because we can have encouragement and unity, but without the foundation of Jesus Christ, those two things won't last. The book of Proverbs talks about gaining wisdom and knowledge, but when we come to know Christ and trust in him, we gain the most wise and knowledgeable person ever to exist. And thinking of Paul's goals and desires here for the church, I started thinking back to a project I took on over Easter. I'd been telling Kate for months that I was going to go out and do some gardening out the front. I was going to dig up a wee strip, turn over the soil, put in some beautiful plants, put a wee net down and put some bark over it, really just to spruce up out the front. Now that task was all left to me, but now and again, Kate would pop her head out the door and go, Richard, have you got the roots in right? And she was asking a very important question. See, if I hadn't got the roots in correctly, the plants would wither, the plants would fade. And folks, isn't that a relevant question for us in our Christian life? If we're not rooted in Christ, in the truth of the gospel, we will perish and we won't last. So these are some goals Paul has for the church. But you'll also notice in verse 4 that he's wary that there's people coming into the church that are willing to deceive them. And he's been building up to this over the past few verses. This is what his laboring has been about. He's wanting them to trust in the risen Savior rather than be deceived. And this is important for us. If we think back to the Garden of Eden, the devil is the first person deceiving and manipulating God's word. He takes his word and just slightly twists it. So we're open to being deceived. We're open to be being led astray. That's why we've got to keep focusing back that Christ is enough. But what about today? What are some ways that you and I could be deceived today to add something to our equation of Christ plus nothing equals everything? Well, you may be reading in the ESV Bible and in verse four, the word deceive means plausible, which means it sounds good on the surface, but when you think about it, it doesn't really stand up. Just like the cows in my story earlier, it sounded really good to them, but in the end, they were tricked. Now, I've already mentioned some at the start, but I want to leave you with an ABC 
of ways that we need to be aware of when we're being deceived. And three plausible arguments that I hear today that pull us away from the superiority of Christ are these three. A, to affirm, to affirm people in the way that they live, to affirm all lifestyles, to affirm all beliefs. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere about it. That's one way that we twist and deny the argument of the gospel just to affirm everything. The B stands for behavior. Well, that person looks like a Christian. They dress up like a Christian. They say Christian things. They keep up the appearance. And we lead people to believe that they're Christians, but they've never truly accepted Jesus Christ. They have behaved. You can see how these two maybe creep into your own thinking, affirming and behaving. And a third one is another very serious, fine-sounding argument. We cheapen the gospel. We diminish our sin and make it look like the gospel isn't that really of a good news story. A question I often ask young people in a small group setting is, do you think we are good people? And time after time again, they all agree. They all think we are good people. The Bible has a different story to say about us, that we're lost, that we're depraved, that our hearts and minds, even in our thoughts and desires, we have wandered from God. If we look back in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, it talks about that Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. If we diminish the sin, we diminish the rescue and the beauty of what Christ has done. If we cheapen our sin and cheapen the message, we short sell Christ to a dying world. So how can you and I keep Christ the focus and not fall for these fine sounding arguments? Well, again, another story came to mind. In January, as lockdown 3 million or whatever it hit, we went on to Zoom and Zooms were day after day. And normally a youth Zoom looked like five minutes of a chat at the start, 15 minutes of a game, 15 minutes of a Bible study. And one day I decided I would do a quiz. Now the problem with doing a quiz is you're trusting a young person to mark the quiz themselves. And when there's a prize of sweets up for grabs, young people can get very carried away very easily. Well, anyway, I purposely made the quiz a little bit difficult so they would get about middle marks. Well, anyway, there was this one young man who kept getting question after question after question right. And I kept asking him, how do you know that? He goes, oh, my mom told me, or I read it on a book, or I've seen it on TV. Anyway, at the end of the quiz, I asked him, could you turn around and show me your answers on a piece of paper. Well, that young man had nothing to show me. He was merely just telling me that he had got the right answers. And folks, God has given us his eternal word. Maybe we should know what it has to say. That way, we won't be deceived. That young man is a perfect example of what can happen to us. He had no answer. And folks, our answer is found in God's eternal word. Paul has laid out some goals he has for the church, some arguments that the church at Colossae need to look out for and arguments that we need to look out for. And now as this section draws to an end in verse five, he's laboring for the church by telling them how they can stand firm. Let me give you two obvious ones for how you can stand firm in Christ before I unpack verse five. Well, let's think about it. This is a letter written to a church belong to a church, read God's word. Those are two obvious conclusions that must be reached as we read God's word today. They belonged in a church. They had not forsaken gathering together and they read God's word. But the main way we stand firm should hopefully be obvious to you. If Jesus plus nothing equals everything, we must never move from Christ. And in verse 5, we're called to stand firm in good order and in firmness. This military language that Paul is depicting here for the church at Colossae draws to mind a battle. Folks, the Christian life is like a battle. And if you don't think it's going to be a battle, you're going to be in for a surprise. There's a battle for your heart, for your mind, for your time, for your money, 
there's a battle. And if you don't know who Christ is and what he has done, I can be sure that you'll be easy pickings for the devil. We must know Christ. And even those of us who know Christ and are rooted in him will face temptations, will face battles. If you're sitting here and you don't believe in Christ, there's a good chance that someone has told you that Jesus is boring. He's only holding your back. Religion is restrictive. Can I ask you a couple of questions as I start to conclude? Do you feel free? Do you wake up each day content? Do you feel like your life has a purpose? Do you ask yourself why you ever bother with your daily work? How do you face sickness? How do you face death? How do you face a partner leaving you, a boyfriend or a girlfriend breaking up with you? What will sustain you in this life? Who will be there in the midst of the battle? Friends, you can have everything and still have nothing if you don't have the work of Christ applied to your life. So to conclude, Paul, while physically absent, is present in spirit. He's present in spirit here, as he says in verse 5, because, they, because him and the church possess Christ. At each stage throughout this letter, Paul wants them to know Jesus, to know the power of his resurrection, to know that Jesus is the most understanding person in the whole world. He wants them to come and believe in Jesus. That is the way they will persevere. Jesus is all there is. Very simple. Having Christ, knowing Christ, will be enough for them to persevere. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. People will try to convince them that Christ wasn't enough. People will try to convince you that Christ won't be enough. This whole letter in Colossians pounds home the message. We're gloriously complete in Christ. Only Christ can comfort us. Only Christ can be our hope. Only Christ can be with us in our hour of need. So are you ready for the battle? Paul's word hopefully has encouraged you. It hopefully alerts you to the idea that people, the world, the flesh, and the devil may try and deceive you. But the truth we stand on is that we're complete in Christ. Only when we're battle ready is when we've realized we can't win the battle. Christ is the victor. Christ is the substitute. Christ is our life. Christ plus nothing equals everything. Let's pray. Lord God, as we have opened your word during this time of worship, different thoughts have gone on in our mind. Our mind has perhaps wandered. Maybe we've been convicted that we've walked away from the truth or that we've never come to the truth. Lord, may today, we know, may we know Christ. May we respond in faith to him. May we turn to him in our hour of need. May we be reassured that Christ is with us, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. May we respond in encouraging one another, in uniting together, in standing firm for these gospel truths. Holy Spirit, be with us now as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, folks, we've come to the end of our service and thank you for joining us. And I hope you've been as blessed and challenged by what Richard has shared with us this morning as I have been, especially that A, B, C, as we think about where we are in terms of our relationship with Christ and his word and his truth. Just a reminder of some of those announcements this evening, our prayer time on Zoom, do join us. Uh, Wednesday night, our midweek with the Reverend Andrew Sweeney. Then on Saturday, remember that retreat day with John and Anne Coles that the diocese are running. And just a reminder that there's also a drive-by uh, tithe and offering collection. Uh, and that's outside this building, outside St. Saviour's on Saturday between 10 and 11.30. So if you wanna uh, give your offering and you haven't been back to in-church worship, uh, that's a good opportunity. So Saturday uh, between 10 and 11.30. And just once again, a reminder for you or for somebody that you know uh, on Pentecost Sunday, 4 p.m. here in St. Saviour's, we're gonna have that compressed service, compressed version of the morning service uh, which if you have got a young family or there's any other reason why you haven't quite made it out yet to morning worship, this one's for you. So get booked in four o'clock on Pentecost Sunday. I just want to close our time together with a blessing. May the Lord bless us this day in the power of the Spirit to go about his work in this place with boldness, love, strength and humility. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.